graduates. We met when we were uh, undergraduates at Michigan and, and uh, Rich was uh, on the water polo team while I was playing hockey. So we met through the athletic department and I soon found out that, um, you know, this guy uh, wanted to be a SEAL and I didn't know any SEALs at the time. And uh, I soon saw him in the weight room doing pull-ups with a 45 pound plate attached to his waist um, and, and doing them at about, you know, 20 at a time. So that was a, I thought I was in shape and then I saw him. So, um, you know, Rich is an amazing guy and he um, follows kind of the, the, the old school Navy SEAL code You'll notice that there's, um, you know, many um, books and things like that that have been written by SEALs recently, but Rich is um, the type of guy that follows the traditional SEAL motto, which is the quiet professional. And he just uh, goes about and does amazing things. Uh, he's incredibly humble. He doesn't look for a lot of fanfare. The type of guy he is when, um, you know, it's extremely competitive to get a slot as, a, as an officer into the SEAL teams. So he, uh, he learned how to speak Indonesian and a couple of uh, different dialects before, uh, while he was, you know, doing uh, some graduate work at Michigan, waiting to see if he got accepted to the SEAL program. While he was doing that, he um, also ran an untrained mile and beat every miler on the University of Michigan track team. He ran that in four minutes and 12 seconds and didn't tell anyone about it. We found out subsequently by guys on the track team. So, so this is the type of guy he is. He went to Bud's, he was the honor man of his, uh, of his SEAL uh, class. Over a hundred guys started in that class and I think 12 graduated and he was on top. And then he's gone on from there to have an absolutely amazing career. Um, on top of that, he's got uh, an incredible wife who's an engineer and runs, she runs her own business, three beautiful children. Um, and he's been all over the world in the United States, and uh, he's an incredible example. So um, Commander Witt, who's also, I should also say, he just was selected as one of the early selectees to make captain. Um, so he'll be Captain Witt soon. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. It's a real honor and privilege to have you here. And thanks for getting up so early for this as well. All right. Thanks. I appreciate that. You make me sound like Superman. Uh, I really appreciate it. I did want to say thank you uh, to Chris for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Q, for having me and the um, Department of Neuros Neurosurgery for inviting me today. Um, Chris and I have been friends for a very long time, and uh, I've definitely leaned on him and probably your organization when I've had some individuals that were injured uh, while we're doing operations. Um, and I've always looked to your organization when I when I really needed some advice on, on how to take care of one of my, one of my people. Um, so first, I just need to make a disclaimer, uh, just as part of this discussion, like, like Chris said, um, I, I don't normally speak, um, you know, we're not, uh, we're in the, you know, movies a lot and things like that, but um, uh, normally this isn't something that I, that I would typically do, but uh, I appreciate being invited. So, First, a disclaimer, just that the views or opinions I present today are, are my personal views and the opinions uh, are my own. They do not represent the views of the Department of Defense or the Navy, just something I have to, to say to keep myself out of trouble. Um, so I don't have any slides. I'm just gonna basically discuss how we uh, select our individuals. Like Chris said, it's, it's a highly selective organization and how we train those individuals and then how we lead small teams. So like Dr. Q said, I do see potentially a lot of similarities in these two organizations. And, and I think we can discuss a lot of what those things are. And uh, there's probably a lot of things I can talk about, but I'm most interested in talking about the things that you may want to hear about. So I'll leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'll probably pause halfway through the discussion and see if there's any initial questions and I kind of adjust my discussion from there. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what we should discuss today. And uh, as I said, I think there's a lot of common ground um, and I'm happy to speak about, potentially to speak about some operations that we've conducted uh, or things that you may be interested in. But I think where we can probably share the most is, uh, and where we can have the most uh, rich discussion would be how we select individuals, how we train those individuals, and 
uh, how we lead small teams, which is the, the focus of my discussion. Um, so arguably the SEAL teams are, are probably one of the most elite and selective organizations in the US and possibly the globe. Uh, I think it's pretty similar to, to your organization and your profession. Um, we had some truly spectacular mission successes, which I'm, I'm sure people have, have heard about um, over the last few decades. I, I probably won't get into to too much of that, but uh, needless to say, we're, we're both very elite organizations and there's a really small, small group of us. So let me first just start by explaining what Naval Special Warfare is, um, how we select, how we train and, and develop our, our people. So 2022 marks the, the 35th anniversary of the formation of Special Operations Command uh, or SOCOM. I'll try not to use too many acronyms, but if I do, please just stop me and ask what they are as it's always a, a different language. Uh, it'll also mark, 2022 also marked the 60th year of the, since the formation of what we call like the modern day SEAL teams. Um, and SEAL is basically an acronym. It stands for sea, air, and land. It just represents the, the three environments that we, we typically operate in. But specifically, SEALs are the maritime component of US Special Operations Command. So our primary mission is to be able to operate from a maritime environment. So I would argue that this distinction makes us one of the most versatile forces in the US military, since our operating environment is constantly changing. Uh, it's generally cold, it's wet, it's miserable, uh, but it's an environment that we, we really have to thrive in. And you know, when we're looking for people, we, we really wanna to try to select individuals that are um, able to operate and thrive in that environment. So let me talk a little bit about how we select individuals to be SEALs. Um, first, really wanna get into the traits that we're looking for and then what type of people we're, we're, we're trying to, to bring into the teams. So we need people that can work really well in small teams and people that will never quit despite the circumstances that they're, they're put in. We need people that are very comfortable, as I said, in the water uh, and can deal with high stress environments. People that know how to adapt and innovate in those environments and uh, no matter what the situation uh, can always perform. Um, the last thing we're really looking for are individuals that can learn new skills very quickly with minimal instructions and um, can, can be very consistent uh, over, over a long period of time. So, okay, so, so how do we do all this? What's the, what's the special way that, uh, that we select these SEALs? Um, so the selection happens at a basic underwater demolition SEAL course or a course we call BUDS. We run that course you know, five times a year here in San Diego, which is where I'm talking from today. Uh, to get into the course is actually you know, not, not that challenging. We have some fairly basic standards that, that I think most people could probably achieve. Um, so to, to get into BUDS or basic SEAL training, you, got, you have to pass a, a basic physical screening test, uh, which includes a 500 yard swim in under 12 and a half minutes, do 50 push ups in two minutes, 50 sit ups in two minutes, uh, 10 consecutive pull ups in two minutes, and run a mile and a half in under 10 and a half minutes. So, again, I think that's all relatively basic. It might not seem, seem that basic, but those are, are pretty minimal, minimal standards. Um, so, really, you just have to, to meet that, that basic physical standard. Then there's also a certain uh, standard you have to meet for mental capacity. Uh, that's test through, that's test tested through a, a basic um, exam that's given by the military called a uh, ASVAB, which is a Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, kind of like a you know, basic ACT, um, real real simple kind of test. Um, so what we find is, is individuals that perform kind of just at the minimums 
of, of those uh, physical and, and mental standards you know, don't necessarily do very well. Uh, what we really are, are looking for when it comes to both of those, those um, you know, set of criteria is individuals that can do a combined like run swim time of about 16 minutes. So that's, you know, doing a mile and a half and, and probably eight to nine minutes uh, and also doing their, their 500 yard swim in about eight minutes. So combined swim time, run swim time of about 16 minutes. And then also people that can do um, probably a hundred pushups, hundred plus pushups, a uh, hundred plus sit-ups in two minutes. And then people that can do 15 or more, more pull-ups. Um, but still, despite all that, you know, we have about uh, only 20 to 25% of the individuals that start training actually make it through the course. And even with all the, the data that we collect um, on individuals that are coming in to, to potentially be SEALs, we find it really hard to, to determine who will make it through training. Um, by looking at the initial data, we can do a pretty good job of figuring out who will not make it through, but we really haven't quite figured out uh, who are the people that will, will make it all the way through the training program. And I'll talk a little bit about that further on in the discussion. Okay, so our course, our basic SEAL selection course is, is broken into to three phases. I'm gonna talk about what each of those phases is and you know, how each of those phases kind of help us determine the, the individuals that we're looking for. Like Dr. Fox said, we start with about a thousand candidates every year. Uh, we run five courses a year. So about 200, 250 people start a course, um, each one of those courses. And we're typically having about you know, 45 to 50 people graduate from that course uh, to get the, the 200, 250 people we're looking for. Uh, like Chris said, you know, my particular class started with a little over uh, 100 individuals and, and we had um, you know, a little over 15 people graduate that, that course. So just talking about um, the first phase of training, uh, like I said, we'll have first phase, second phase, and third phase. So the first phase of training is about seven or eight weeks long, and the training culminates uh, in the third or fourth week with what we call Hell Week. Uh, it's a week that's extremely physically and, and mentally challenging. And during this week, each candidate may sleep about four to six hours in total. So I know as doctors, you're probably used to lots of sleep deprivation and having a function without having uh, slept a lot. I hope it's not, you know, only four to six hours of sleep in a five or six day total, but uh, that, that is how we, we kind of stress our element out in that, uh, in that week we call Hell Week. So we made this phase so difficult for, for two primary reasons. You know, one, is that it's, it's so hard, I'd say no individual complete the week without being able to, to work well in a team. Um, individuals that don't get along with others or, or can't contribute to the group basically will get singled out at some point during that week and will not, will not make it through the week on their own. So because the week itself is, is so challenging, they have to learn to work well together in a small team. We'll put the, the group together with about six or seven people. We call it a, a boat crew. And that boat crew has to be able to work together uh, to, to get through that week. Um, during that week, we basically push people uh, to their physical and, and mental limits. We, we do that you know, by just repetitive physical evolutions, like we said, with, with no real rest. Uh, we also stress these candidates uh, primarily by also making them extremely cold. So here, uh, the training is here in San Diego and as people that have been in San Diego or on the West Coast of California, the ocean temperature here is about 60 degrees. So we have the candidates in the water quite a bit during that, that week of training. Um, we generally try to keep their core body temperature during that week around 95 degrees. 
Uh, we have basically a few different ways of, of measuring that. What we found is, is 95 is, is a good temperature where an individual can still function, but they're extremely uncomfortable. So at a sustained 95 degree core body temperature, um, an individual really doesn't want to do much of anything when they're cold. So we'll continue to ask them to perform and individuals that, uh, that can't perform, they can basically quit whenever they want. It's a completely voluntary program. So once someone's you know, that cold for, for that long, um, they, will, they will definitely want to, to not continue the program. So the, the individuals that we see that make it through that week uh, understand that you know, what they're sacrificing during that week is, is going to pay off in the long run. And, um, and they can learn how to deal with that stress uh, during that, that week. During that week, we, we lose about 70% of uh, the people that start. So a lot of attrition happens during that week. Um, and what we, we end up on the, the other side of that week is, is people that know how to deal with stress and people that we are absolutely sure um, will not quit. Because if they didn't quit during that week, then they're probably not gonna quit further on in the, the training pipeline. So once they finish that, that first phase of training, they go to the, the second phase of training, which the first phase was primarily you know, geared to, to find out two things. Like I said, how bad they wanna be there um, and how, how well they can work together in a, a small team. In the second phase of training, we do a lot of, of diving. So again, we're, we're still in the water, but we're talking about you know, combat diving, learning how to, to dive in a pool, and then learning how to dive in the ocean. So this phase of training really narrows in on uh, individual performance. So the culminating event in the second phase of training is an evolution called pool competency or, or pool comp. This is where we get you know, really a, a chance to, to make sure that these individuals are comfortable in the water. We do this um, pool comp and it's a test that lasts about 20 minutes um, where a candidate is in a, a pool that's about 10 to 15 feet deep and they have their, all their scuba equipment on and they'll be crawling on the bottom of the, the pool. And then there'll be an instructor, a SEAL already, that'll be hovering over the top of them as they're crawling on the bottom of the pool. And they'll basically dive down and, and harass them throughout the, the 20 minutes. We really want to see how that candidate can deal with that harassment and then do problem solving under stress underwater. So each candidate's given really four problems in, in the water that they have to solve over that 20 minute period. The first problem involves, like I said, an instructor diving down, usually ripping an individual's fins and mask off. And then um, a candidate has uh, two hoses that they're breathing out of. One's an inhalation hose and one's an exhalation hose. So the first problem usually involves um, instructor diving down and tying up that person's exhalation hose. So a person can still get air, but they're having problems breathing out. So they have to be able to untie that knot that's tied in their, their hose, uh, get all their equipment back on, and then start crawling on the bottom again. Then an instructor will dive back down, and, and typically the, the second problem ties up their, their inhalation hose. So now they, they have no air to breathe underwater, and they have to problem solve, untie their hose, uh, get it all working again, and then start crawling on the bottom. The third problem really involves dying, tying both hoses together. So now you can't breathe in and you can't breathe out. You have to untie both the hoses um, you know, while you're holding your breath and get your equipment to work again, and then start uh, crawling on the bottom again. The final problem, really, we try to determine um, that they realize that there's a problem that it's just too hard for them to solve and they have to, to leave their equipment then on the bottom. So 
we call that the, the whammy problem or the whammy knot. Structure will come down and yank your hoses, tie them up into some impossible knot. And then as a student, you have to be able to, to maintain your calm, holding your breath, um, realize that this is a problem you can't solve, and then uh, take all your equipment off, put it on the bottom of the pool deck, and then request permission from your instructor to, to surface. Get permission from your instructor at that point, and then you know, surface by leaving your, your gear at the bottom. So again, it's four tests. Uh, really last the, the overall test probably lasts about 20 minutes. And we really are hoping to just get out of that uh, 20 minute test uh, a really good understanding that this individual it can operate very um, confidently under the water. So that's the first phase of training is really more of a team selection event. And the second phase of training really lets us hone in on the individual and make sure that they can perform well individually under stress and then be able to, to continue to function. So hopefully an individual can hold their breath for hope, no longer than a minute typically to, to solve that problem, but um, you know, it could be a minute, minute and a half or, or longer. All right, so the, the third phase of training, we've gone through the first phase, second phase, now the third phase of training, um, in the second phase, we'll typically lose about 10 to 15% of the individuals that start. So it's not a, a really high number, but that'll, most of the attrition is, is generally happened in those first two phases. And we get to the third phase of training, which is called the demolition weapons and tactics phase. Uh, this phase, we don't normally lose a, a lot of people from the training, but the people that we do lose, uh, it's usually for, for some safety violation. So in this third phase of training, what we're really looking for is uh, where how quickly someone can learn a new skill. So a lot of people come into this phase of training and they may not, uh, they may not have learned how to, to shoot a pistol or to shoot a rifle or to work with demolition. So we're, we're teaching them really quickly and we wanna see that they can pick up a skill that we're teaching them in just a few days and then test out of that skill at a basic or advanced level. So we may teach them how to, how to shoot a pistol in two to three days, and then at the fourth or fifth day, they have to be able to test out as a basic marksman. Same thing for a, a rifle. Teach them how to shoot a rifle, and then on the third or fourth day, after being taught for a day or two, you know, how to, to test out as a basic marksman or even an expert um, pistol shooter, expert rifle. Uh, that, the other thing that we'll also teach them is, is how to work with uh, basic explosives. Uh, most people haven't done any of that type of work, so we'll teach them very quickly how to, how to do that you know, over the course of two to three days, and then we'll have them run um, you know, basic demolition. And we want to make sure that they have been able to uh, pick up that skill very quickly, and they can perform extremely safely, you know, following all the guidelines that we've laid out for safety. In that phase of training, again, I'll go back to uh, how we really stress them out. You know, the first two phases, it was mostly through cold water that we were, were stressing the individuals. In the third phase, we do a lot of um, sleep deprivation, uh, where, where they're just not sleeping a lot, maybe three to four hours a night, you know, at most maybe five for, for weeks at a time. We wanna see how they can learn under that type of stressful environment. And this is where I'd say we probably have some you know, similarities with potentially how you're trained. You know, When you're going through residency and you're not sleeping a whole lot and you're, you're trying to learn and pick up new skills, it's, it's not the ideal learning environment necessarily, but it does give us the opportunity to, to really put them under stress and and to see how quickly they can learn. So in that third phase of training, we don't necessarily lose many people, not many people quit, but there are some individuals that just are not able to learn a new skill very quickly and they'll have safety violations and we'll have to remove them from training. That's really important to us because we're gonna 
at this point of training, they've only really learned the basics. And as they continue to progress through the, the SEAL teams, we're gonna continue to teach them more and more advanced skills. And if they can't learn things very quickly in a very short period of time and master those skills, those are just individuals that, that were, are not gonna be successful in the SEAL teams. So I think there's, there's probably a lot of similarities that we'd find between the two groups. Okay, so at the end of this whole process, I kind of covered this a little bit already. We have about a thousand candidates that start uh, the SEAL selection process. And, and at the end of that, that whole process, we'll have about 200 to 250 SEALs. So overall, this means that the SEAL community is only about 10,000 people total, about a third of that, so about 3,000, a little over 3,000 individuals are actually Navy SEALs. Uh, the rest of the organization is, uh, is a support element or civilians. Um, so of the a little over 3,000 active duty Navy SEALs that we have, about 700 of those individuals are officers and about 2,500 people are enlisted. Officers for us typically means that that person has gone through a uh, you know, college degree program, earned a, a college degree, and has gone through some type of officer commissioning program. And then on the enlisted side, a lot of our enlisted actually have college degrees, uh, but they haven't necessarily signed up to, to be an officer. Um, the average age of our individuals is about 25 to 28 years old, so generally a little bit older uh, by the time they, they join the, the military. And like I said, most of them have um, advanced degrees, either a, a college degree or a master's degree, or in, in some cases, a you know, PhD. The overall training pipeline, uh, each of those phases that I, I mentioned previously is about seven to eight weeks long, but that's just the basic training course. So overall, that's about a six month course. Then an individual go to an advanced training course, which is another six to eight months. And then from there, they'll get assigned to a SEAL team where they'll do about you know, 18 to 24 months of additional training before they ever uh, conduct you know, their first set of operations. So we're looking at you know, three to four years of, of training, uh, possibly before an individual will actually conduct their, their first set of operations, which again, I think there's probably a lot of similarities with how you train individuals before they're ready to start some of their first surgeries. Um, all right, so I, I just wanna cover a few general lessons learned here um, about some of the individuals that, that come into training and then I'll, I'll tell a few quick stories and then I'm, I'm open to, to any questions. Like I said, we can't predict who will make it through. Uh, we, we've really been trying to, to figure that one out because if we could go out and screen individuals right off the bat and pick out the ones that are going to be steals, we would, we would save a lot of money and save a lot of time and be a uh, pretty awesome selection process there. But uh, what we can do is we can determine who will not make it through training. So we have individuals that come in to, to be SEALs and we've had gold medalists, Olympians, college athletes, uh, triathletes, wrestlers, water polo players. We just can't predict which of those individuals will, will make it through. But what we do find is there's, there's kind of at least two traits that, that I would say kind of shine through for, for individuals that'll be successful. The first one is uh, individuals that have had some type of challenging background and have been able to deal with that uh, adversity in their background and somehow be successful. So nothing specific there, but these may be you know, growing up with, without a lot of money, uh, growing up in a single parent household, uh, being their first kid to go to college and earn a college degree. So some type of adversity in their background where I would say that they've, they've dealt with that challenge, learned how to deal with it and have you know, somehow been successful, which is just a common thread I, I think we see in, in some of the candidates that, that make it through. The second thing that we would generally see is uh, 
people that have learned how to deal with hard problems. And, and I'm sure you see a lot of the, the same things here. So this, yeah, we asked people up front, like how they have dealt with adversity in the past. And the, the things we're looking for here is, is really primarily based on some basic sports psychology. So um, if you're presented with a very difficult problem, you would typically break it down into much smaller, more manageable pieces. Uh, you wouldn't try to tackle that problem you know, at its, its hardest level right off the bat. You would be able to visualize your success. So visualize yourself completing a very complicated surgery or visualize yourself you know, completing a marathon. Uh, and you also know how to calm yourself down when you're under stress. So some basic things that people will do, you know how to um, slow down, take some deep breaths, maybe close your eyes, uh, before you're going to, to do something that's very complicated, you will visualize yourself doing that. You'll visualize yourself being successful. So we'll actually run individuals through a, a basic sports psychology test before they, they enter into the program. And we'll get an assessment of, of how well they are at, at doing that, how well they are at dealing with extremely hard problems, uh, remaining calm in those situations and then being able to, to be successful uh, with something like that. So some of this is just based on some, some sports psychology. So anyone that's in the group that's trained for a marathon or, or done anything that's really difficult, you know, a marathon is a, is a good example. Like you're not gonna start your training by running 18 to 20 miles right off the bat. You're gonna first develop a training program you're gonna do a two to three mile run your first day and then build up from there. Um, you're gonna potentially think about what it's like to finish that marathon. You're gonna visualize what the morning will be like, what it'll feel like for you to wake up, what it'll feel like for you to, to cross the finish line. Um, and that'll be the, the kind of thing that'll, that'll progress you through some, some really hard challenge. So, these are the things that we're looking for when we're doing selection. Again, we can't predict who will make it through the program, but these do help us determine who will not make it through. So if we can cut that group out at the start that we know will, might, will likely not make it through, that can save us quite a bit of time. And I'm sure these are all lessons that, that you all um, have in, in your background when you're dealing with a you know really complicated surgery or how do you train an individual to, to work through a really challenging problem. The other thing, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is just how we lead in small teams. Um, you know, it, our working environment can be very stressful at times. It can be very loud. There could be explosions or bullets flying. Uh, so as a leader, we really want to teach our individuals to lead their team uh, in an extremely calm way. Uh, the way that we would try to do that is you know, specifically by you know, the leader remaining calm themselves. So we'll, we'll put people in situations that are, are high stress. And we really want to evaluate how that individual will do in that, that stressful environment. Some of the things we're looking for there is you know, what is the demeanor of that person when put into that stressful environment? Do they shout and scream and yell uh, and kind of get everybody you know, more excited and amped up, which is usually not good to try to remain calm in a, a very stressful situation? Or do they maintain their calm and then the whole team remains calm? and they're able to be very successful in that situation. So some of the things we're looking for specifically would be you know, that the leader uh, doesn't necessarily, like I said, get too excited. They're, they're not yelling and screaming at people there. They're remaining kind of a very calm demeanor, uh, very consistent throughout the process. They're giving clear direction. They're, they're not making something too complicated. Uh, giving just clear, concise instructions during that, that stressful environment. Uh, 
I, I mentioned at the start how we also have you know, officers and enlisted. Uh, one of the main things that we do is we don't separate our officers and enlisted when they're going through training together. So this might be something that is, you know, it's very different in the Navy and it, it may be very different in your environment where you, know, you train the neurosurgeons in one environment, you train the nurses and the other staff in another environment, and then you, you bring people together. We really try to, to shy away from that as much as possible. We keep our officers and enlisted together, you know, right from day one when we start training and we don't, we don't create like two separate teams and then bring them together at the end. So our officers you know, start training with our enlisted, uh, like I said, from day one. And then we really just expect more from our officers as they're going through training. So we want to teach them to take care of their team uh, before they take care of themselves. So things we're looking for is the, the group will go eat three meals a day together and we'll want to see like our officers are eating last and all the enlisted individuals eat first. Um, so they learn you know, right from, from day one to, to take care of their team before they take care of themselves. We also make sure that they're not necessarily treated any differently. So we don't have our officers that sleep in a barracks room or basically like a hotel room that's nicer than the one that the enlisted members sleep in. Um, we make sure that they're all kind of in the same general working environment and there's no kind of special treatment for one over the other. Officers are you know, given the same gear. They're not given any gear that's or equipment that's nicer than what the enlisted individuals get. Everyone gets the same thing. And the expectation really is that the officers, you know, need to take care of their enlisted. And, um, and then the enlisted in turn will really help take care of the team, which is the people that for the most part will probably do more of the work. Um, so again, this is not really typical uh, across the Navy. You know, the Navy structure maybe like the, the medical structure in some ways can be very hierarchical. Um, you know, in the Navy, you have officers on a ship that eat separately. They don't eat together with the rest of the enlisted. They eat in the, um, you know, their own separate eating area. And the enlisted folks come in and serve their meals for them. Um, these are things like when I go on a, a ship in the Navy, I find it very foreign. I, I, I struggle with it myself where I'm, I'm so used to working together in a small team and not getting special treatment. I, I find it very difficult to, to go onto a Navy ship and have to separate myself and eat in a separate area, sleep in a separate area and not be with, with my team. So it can be really hard for a, a Navy SEAL element to, to get on a ship and, and try to work in that that environment that's just very separated. I understand why it's done, but uh, it, it, it can still be, be very difficult. Okay, so the, the final thing I'm just gonna to cover here and then we can open it up for any questions that anyone have would just a, a few stories about, about leadership and, and decision-making. So the first one is, is from myself, uh, a story where I was going through training and I was a, uh, had been in the SEAL teams about five or six years. I was in charge of a small team of about 20. So it's where I was considered the, the platoon commander. That group is called a, a SEAL platoon. We're off the coast here in, in San Diego at a place called San Clemente Island. It's a, a small island that the Navy runs. Uh, it's about 60 miles off the coast. And, and we can do a lot of really good training there where we're coming from the ocean, going over the beach, and then we can do some live fire shooting once we get on, on the, the beach, and then we can move back into the water. So I was going through a training evolution like this with my, my SEAL platoon, and we were going to jump out of a plane uh, with parachutes on and jump into the water. Uh, we we're gonna push out some small boats from the plane before we jumped out of the plane and then set up those boats and drive them around the island, get out of the boats, go over the beach with our, our weapons, 
um, basically assault a, a target on the beach and then move back into the water and do the whole thing in reverse to, to get back to to get back to our, our operating base. So we're up in the air and, and we're getting ready to jump out of this plane and there's certain limitations where if it's too windy, you're not supposed to be able to, to jump out of the plane. So we all have our parachutes on and our wetsuits and our, our dive pins on our, our feet. And uh, we get the notification from the, the jump master running this evolution that we're just beyond the limits of, of where we can jump out of the plane. Yeah, and say the limits, 20 mile per hour winds and we're at you know, 21. So we're, we're not gonna jump. Like, okay, well, so they basically decide we're gonna circle in the air for a while while we wait and see if the, the winds will die down. Uh, so this was supposed to be a daytime jump and we're, we're kind of getting close to the sun setting. So we're up there flying around for about an hour and the sun is starting to go down. So now we're getting into potentially doing this jump where the, the sun will be setting, there won't be as much light. And um, we get the notification from the, the jump master at this time that we're right at like you know 19.5 miles per hour to, to do this jump. So right at the limit. So they decide we're gonna, we're gonna do the jump and we're gonna start this, this training evolution. So we jump out of the plane right at the, the limitation, the highest limitation we can to, to do this training evolution. And, um, and to no one's surprise, like everyone gets scattered out over the water. Uh, I almost had two individuals from my group of 20 nearly drowned, um, which was not good, obviously. And um, there was a new person that was running the, the drop zone, so down in, in boats. So I get down now as the leader and uh, I ask this person like, hey, do you have a, a good head count of where all my people are? And he has no idea. He's trying to, to actually collect our parachutes, which are really expensive. But as anyone knows, like I could care less about the parachutes. I'm, I'm more concerned about my people. And, and, you know, do you have accountability of all those people? So at this point, I basically take charge of the the situation as soon as I, I get it get out of the water I'm like all right forget about the parachutes um, I really don't care about the parachutes I need a, a good head count of, of all my individuals so we're able to find everyone it takes about an hour like I said the sun's going down um, we're all really cold and wet and miserable like I said but now we have about a three-hour boat ride uh, through now it's really high wind area. So if you've been in high winds, 20 miles per hour or more over the water, you realize there's high waves and boats don't do well in, in high waves. So if you've been to any amusement parks, you know, like in Disney World down there and those boat rides where like it's a tidal wave coming over you every time, that was pretty much our, our three hour boat ride around the island. So individuals are just, holding on to the boat for kind of dear life for three hours as we're, we're taking this boat ride around the island. We finally get to our training site and we have to go over the beach. And I think at this point, everyone just wants to be done with this evolution or we feel like we're, we're ready to just get this thing completed. So the boats typically drop us off about, you know, maybe a thousand meters off the beach where this, in this case, uh, we asked the boats, basically the boat drivers really kind of decided they were just gonna take us as close into the beach as they possibly could and then, and then drop us off. Now, well, they ended up getting so close that the boat almost got picked up by a wave and like pushed into the shore. And it's right at the time where we were getting out of the boat. And, you know, myself as the leader, I, what I learned that night is, um, you know, despite, how tired we were, how miserable we were. I couldn't kind of seed my leadership up to other individuals, which is, is what I, I basically did. And I let those boats get way too close. Um, a boat almost got picked up and, and dropped on the beach, uh, which would have um, probably you know, landed on a few of my guys that were getting out, getting out of the boat at the time. Thankfully that didn't happen. Uh, we were able to complete the evolution and get back in the boats at the end and, and go back and, and 
you know, kind of debrief what had happened. So for myself as a leader, I made a bunch of mistakes that night, but um, I had a senior officer and senior enlisted guy really kind of get on my case at the end of that evolution and kind of tell me where I'd, where I'd made mistakes. And um, really, it's probably learned more from that single evolution with all the mistakes that I made and, and realized that I uh, should never make those mistakes again. And um, how to not give up leadership at critical points, you know, despite how tired or hungry or uh, miserable I was. So definitely humbling uh, in that event and then how to just learn from my mistakes. One other quick story and then I'll, I'll open up for, for questions. Uh, the, the last one was uh, on this last deployment that I did to uh, Iraq or we did to uh, Iraq where I had a, another SEAL platoon that was out going to conduct an operation and there uh, was an Iraqi police element that was kind of in the area that these, these folk, my, my element was going to conduct their, their operation. As they were trying to approach these Iraqi police officers uh, that were, were staying in a, in a house close to the area that they were going, the Iraqi police element started shooting at them, shooting at my, at my guys. Uh, so they knew it. They knew that this was a, a, a police uh, a friendly police element and they were able to kind of hunker down behind a uh, small hill that they were on and you know really spend the next 20 30 minutes trying to deconflict the situation without you know necessarily harming this friendly force so earlier in the the training cycle with this element i had had um, gone through and replaced the platoon commander. The, the one that I had in place was not doing very well. I'd kind of seen it in training. He didn't deal with stress very well. He didn't make good decisions. Uh, he wasn't leading his team very well. So I'd actually replaced the leader um, and, and removed him and replaced him with another guy that, that I knew had been uh, made good decisions and, and was a good leader. So this was the team that, that was on the ground and uh, this individual leader, another you know, the young SEAL lieutenant that had been in for about six or seven years, really remaining calm despite this Iraqi police element. Um, and they were shooting their weapons at, at my guys for about 15 minutes. They fired rocket propelled grenades over their heads. Um, were really, pretty aggressive Iraqi police element, which is not something I always see. But uh, my, my guys did a great job. They remained calm throughout the whole evolution. Uh, they were problem solving as they were going through the, the night. As a leader, I, I wasn't on the ground with them. I was actually observing this one from a, uh, what we call a joint operation center or jock. Uh, from a distance away from, from where they were conducting the operation. And as a leader, I had to trust that individual that was on the ground now making these decisions um, to not, to make the right, to make the right decisions. And I think there's a, there's definitely a point where as a leader that's observing this, I want to step in and kind of take charge and start running the, the situation. But at this point, my role was to really support that element that was on the ground and to try to figure out what support he needed and how to help them work through it, not to try to take charge of, of the scenario. And you know, really from a room uh, several you know, miles away to, to try to understand what was going on on the ground and start making decisions for this individual. So we were able to work through that together. Um, the kind of end of this story is you know, no one, no one on either side was was hurt really badly. Uh, we did have one of our uh, interpreters that was was shot, um, but it wasn't. It didn't end up being uh, too too bad. Uh, we were able to bring in a helicopter. Uh, 
with medical capability, remove him, get him back to, to higher level of care, and then actually continue and complete the mission uh, after deconflicting the, the situation. But I think the lessons learned here is you know, having the right leadership in place, that element remaining calm, problem solving, um, giving clear and concise directions throughout the whole evolution, and then letting the leader on the ground make those decisions, not myself as the person in charge of the SEAL team at the time, trying to take charge of the situation too much, support the team that's actually conducting the operation and not take away uh, too much from that, that person on the ground that's conducting this particular uh, operation. Okay, so that, that kind of just completes my plan discussion points. Um, again, you know, stressing how we select individuals, how we kind of train those individuals, and then you know, some, some points on leadership. So I'll stop there and, and open, open it up for questions or send it back to Chris or Dr. Q. Rich, that was, that was amazing. I mean, really incredible talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I mean, you and I have obviously spoken a lot about these things in the past. Um, so I, I have many questions I could ask, but I'm going to defer to a couple of other folks who have reached out to me and also in the chat who have some, but um, I just, I see so many parallels, um, you know, in terms of your journey and, and, you know, learning and then be, becoming the teacher. And, and that happens for many of us in neurosurgery. And it's, it's, um, I, I just really appreciate your perspective on this, but, uh, uh pa Paola, you have, um, you, you were one of the first to message me. So you want to ask, uh, Commander Witt your, your question. Sure. Uh, good morning, Commander Witt. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, listening on your journey and how you train other SEALs. I have one question. Um, how you do, do you develop this mental toughness uh, that is necessary during training and how do you keep it long term? And as a follow up question uh, for Dr. Fox, do you think military training resembles neurosurgical training? And if so, how and how being in the military makes you a better surgeon? Thank you. All right, uh, I'll go. I'll go first. So I think it was, uh, you know, how do you develop this mental toughness, and then how do you maintain it long term? So the the mental toughness aspect of it, I think that the main thing we see there is is the people that end up making it through training are extremely mentally tough. So like, like I said, in the, the first part of the discussion is you know, we make training so hard physically, but what we're really testing is people's ability to um, be mentally tough. So um, example there is like, we could, we could talk about how many miles we run in training and how long we can hold our breath and, and all these things that, that, you know, just seem physically nearly impossible. Um, but, but really the, the main thing that we're looking for, you know, despite, despite all you know, the amazing things that, that you know, we put people through is really how people think through those problems. Like, how, do you, how are you able to, to use the 12 inches above your, your neck to, to solve a problem, you know, despite you know, trying to, to muscle your way through something? So an example I would have there is um, we talked about the pool competency and um, you know, it can be a very stressful, stressful evolution uh, for myself. Personally, I was, a, like Chris had said, a, a water polo player and a, and a runner. So I was, as a water polo player, very used to holding my breath and, and being you know, grabbed underwater and things like that. But as you're doing this pool competency, you're getting harassed and twisted around and it's very stressful. Um, one thing I, I learned there was how to, you know, try to keep track of time. So I tried to, to know how long I could hold my breath and, you know, tried to think of a way to, to kind of keep track of how long I've been underwater without any air. So in that situation for myself as, as a, you know, way to, 
to develop my mental toughness is like, as I was getting jostled around, I was trying to, trying to like feel like what my heart rate was, like what my heartbeat was. And I could have that consistent heart rate. I could feel it as I was underwater. And that kind of helped me keep track of time. Like hopefully my heart rate wasn't getting too high and you know, I could feel like, okay, I've, you know, there's 10 beats, there's 20 beats, there's 30 beats. And that kind of relates to, to time instead of getting too focused on, oh man, how long have I been underwater now? And I'm getting super stressed out, really just trying to solve the problem. I need to hold my breath for a certain amount of time. I need to solve this problem. And then I need to, to move on. How do we maintain that long-term? I think the way we do that is we consistently test people. Like there's never uh, a, a time where we're not continually pushing people, teaching them new things and, and, um, and putting them under pressure. We, we as an organization kind of have you know, fairly unlimited resources, I'm sure kind of like the Mayo Clinic and, and we have no limitations on how much we can train. We have very few limitations on the amount of ammunition we have or training sites and things like that. So we put a lot of focus on how we train people. We put some of our best people into an organization that runs our training. And then uh, we, we consistently push the team and, and test them. So I think that allows us to maintain that mental toughness over time. It's not like uh, you've made it, you're a SEAL now, you, you went through the first three years of training and, and you're good. And you're never going to be tested again. Like every day is a selection day and every day you're, you're going to get tested uh, to see how you perform. All right, I'll turn it over to Chris to, to answer his portion. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And uh, I, I, it's a great answer too. I see again, many parallels. I think um, for me, uh, mental toughness is developed through repetition. And I think, you know, Rich and I both learned that early on and, and, um, the athletic department at Michigan, and there was a lot of repetition and a lot of frequent um, exposure to stressful situations, and you just become more comfortable in that. And, and that's really a mainstay of neurosurgical training, right? I mean, you're you're under stress um, for seven years, um, and it's a different type of stress. I was having a conversation with someone in the chat thread. One of the, the main differences between what we do as neurosurgeons and what SEALs do is when we make a mistake, patients get hurt. And when SEALs make a mistake, they get hurt or killed or their buddy does. So it's a completely different um, level, um, but it's, it's similar in many ways. And I think, um, you know, whatever those exposures are, whether it's, you know, something very difficult academically or something difficult athletically or being in the military and going through these stressful experiences, um, they're, they're cumulative over the course of your life. And that's how you continue to stay, um, you know, mentally tough. And I think one other point that Rich just made, I think that's a, that's a big one for us is that, you know, everything we do is a continuum. You don't graduate from residency and then all of a sudden it's all, you know, rainbows and, and flowers and you're uh, the attending now, or you're running a SEAL team. And it's like, you have all the answers you're, you have to constantly strive to, um, to learn, to make yourself better. Um, you know, I was talking with our residents recently and, and, and did the same at UF and, and everyone wants to know, is it, is residency, is it harder or, or easier after residency? Personally, I think it's harder. Some things are easier, but many things are harder. And, 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 you know, so as you go on, it's this continuum of, of experiences that, that lead to that kind of mental toughness. That's a great question. Ricardo, you had, um, you had a question too. Um, why don't you go ahead and yes, ask? Sir. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you, for, thank you for your service and thank you for the talk today. It was uh, amazing insight. Um, we always watch movies, but I think movies don't even make it, uh, um, make it justice to, to what we just heard. Um, but um, I had a few questions. Um, one of them related with, with what Dr. Fox just mentioned about making decisions and how that affect other people. And how did you deal with making a decision that maybe was not the best at, at the moment and may have an effect on your team and down the road when you have to make another decision again, how you make sure that doesn't affect uh, your decision making down the line. Um, I also wanted to know if you could change one thing in the training, would you, is there anything that you think could 
uh, you would change or not. And uh, then you always highlighted uh, qualities of, uh, you, you did highlight qualities of, of what you see, the trends that you see in people that succeed. But you also mentioned there are some promising candidates that uh, they end up failing. What do you see in them that uh, is lacking or that they have that you think is not letting them succeed? Uh, great, that, that's a really good question, Sarah. I'll, I'll try to answer these ones quickly um, and, and just go, go through the, the three kind of main questions. So decisions, you know, decisions people may not like. Um, I think what we try to do, what I try to do here and what we try to do here is really to be as as open and kind of a you know, flat organization as, as possible. So people understand why we're making those decisions. There's definitely going to be lots of things that, you know, a team is not going to necessarily be happy about. But I think the best thing we can do there is, is make sure people understand why we're making a decision. And um, even if they don't agree with it, they, they have as much of an understanding about why we're making it. And, um, and, and at least that, that can help them if, if they don't agree with it. There are definitely going to be some times where I may make a decision where you may not understand it, but there's probably some times where I just don't have time to explain it. And maybe I can come back and explain it to you later. Uh, that the other thing you asked about, like in training, if there was you know, something we could adjust in training or, or differences. And I think some of the things we're, we're starting to add now would be like ethical dilemmas in training. You know, a lot of the training has been probably geared towards more, all right, just, you know, functioning. How well do you uh, move through a room or move through a house or, you know, fire, fire a weapon, but let's, let's put some, what I'd call like ethical dilemmas in training. Let's, let's say you're, you're going to, to, you know, capture some individual and, and in the scenario, we, we put the, the individual that you're going to, to capture is, is wounded. How do you actually now deal with that scenario? And, and how do we test you ethically and morally to, to make sure that you meet the, the highest ethical and moral standards that we have? Um, and then uh, what was the, the third portion? I can't remember the, the third question. So um, basically, what, what have you seen in those candidates that are very promising, but they end up failing? Is there anything that they lack or anything that you'll see? Yeah, great, great, great question. I, I think the thing that we see is they individually, they may be outstanding. Like I talked about gold medalists and Olympians and things like that. But I think what we find is they just don't, they don't work well necessarily in a team and they're not necessarily willing to self-sacrifice themselves. So those would be probably the, the two things I think we see. This individual has every ability to perform well and be successful. They can run as fast as the fastest person. They can swim better than anybody else, but they just don't have that mental toughness or adversity and, and when things get a little bit hard for them is really in, in our training there will always be something that's just harder than anything you've ever done at some point and we want to see how you deal with that problem you know, something that's not necessarily handed to you uh, along the way and, and how do you deal with that adversity thank you very much i think most of that can be applied to other <laughs> neurosurgery real life and it's just great life advice so thank you very much yeah, I remember uh, one one particular thing that that Rich told me soon after he graduated from Buds, um, and he said that you know at some point during training, everyone is going to get, to get to the point where they essentially can't go on on their own. They need their teammates to step up and and help them get through something that's really tough. And and that's a huge selection point for the instructor instructors because they see like if, if they see a group of guys who are going to help someone who's really struggling, it speaks a tremendous amount to, to that person's character, um, you know, and, and, and lets them know that, hey, the rest of the group really wants this person to succeed. And so certainly in my training, you know, there were times where I really leaned on, you know, senior residents or other faculty. And, and I think when anyone's doing anything that's really tough, I mean, climbing a mountain, it's a team sport, you know, so these are all, um, skills that that translate from from one difficult challenging thing to another
Well, does anyone else have any other any other questions? Any anyone else want to bring anything up out there? Oh, let's see. We have one from uh, Mike Pullen. Let's see. Mike says, "How do you learn to not accept failure and to kill the quit? Is this something you feel is innate or built over time?" That's a great question. Yeah, I think I think there might have been another question in there too about simulation type training. So I'll just kind of answer both of those. So really, like, how do you uh, kill the quit? I, I think in this case, like I, I was a, a SEAL instructor for two years. I was in charge of um, kind of that third phase of training for a while. And I, I ran several of the, the hell weeks as a, a shift OIC, which is a, a person that's in charge of like an eight hour block of training over a 24 hour period. And like I said, people can quit at any time if they want in training. Uh, one night I had, I think what's what people consider like the hardest part of, of SEAL training. Um, it, it's that it's actually um, won't seem like the hardest thing, but uh, we start Hell Week on a Sunday night, typically. So a group of individuals will be all in a tent and they'll be, you know, kind of hanging out. And then we'll, we'll start Hell Week by shooting blank weapons around them, making it super chaotic. So that first night is, is really, really chaotic. Like I said, we're, we're almost trying to, we're trying to get people to quit. So they go through the first night of training. A lot of people quit and they get into to Monday, you know, sunrise, the sun's coming up. It's a new day. Everyone's, you know, motivated and they go through that whole day, Monday, and then, you know, nightfall comes and we, we let individuals eat uh, four meals a day. So uh, we don't, we don't contain, constrain any amount of food that they eat. So Monday night dinner, uh, they, they sit down for an hour and they're warm. They're in a room eating, very comfortable. Uh, you may be surprised, but the time we see the most people quit is at the end of that dinner. Um, it, it's the time where you would think that they are the most comfortable. They've just eaten. They are warm. They're not wet. Uh, but when people come out of that dinner, mentally, they are thinking about how hard that next night is going to be. We talked about how hard that first night was and they get inside their own head and start already thinking about they're not going to make it through that next night. And we get more people quit at the end of dinner before we've done anything than almost any other time during Hell Week. And it's a completely mental aspect of the, the selection process. So to, to answer your question about, about quitting, um, honestly, I don't try to stop people from quitting most of the time. Uh, I want to see them quit to some degree, like uh, I don't want the individuals that'll be there that aren't gonna be able to deal with um, how hard it is. I do have to balance that a little bit sometimes as an instructor, as I was talking about, we've had, once they see one person quit, they start to doubt themselves and they, they will sometimes see like lots of people quit that really have no reason to quit. Like they're all perfectly capable of making it through the training. Um, but, but I have seen like once one person quits, the next person quits, the next person quits. So um, all I can really do at that point as an instructor is kind of back off a little bit, try to let the class recover itself, build its confidence back up before we kind of put stress on them, them again. Uh, um, and, and then I think that the second part is, you know, how do you um, defeat the quit kind of or build that up over time and again i think it's just pushing people to their limits and beyond a little bit and then kind of backing off and then pushing them again to their limits over time and then backing off and we just kind of repetitively do that so we can kind of build them up and build their confidence up uh, the other thing just about you know realistic training uh, that is something that we we stress as much as possible we we do a lot of training and we try to make it as realistic as possible uh, that, that just allows people to, to push themselves as hard as they can in, in training. And, um, so when they get to a real life situation, 
they've already kind of gone through something as close to, to real as possible. So they're, they're not surprised when they're, they're in that situation. Carlos, I think you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, do you think that there is a stereotype when people can quit or is actually really random? Physical or mental stereotype? Yeah, I don't know if there's any stereotypes. Like, do you mean like for how people quit or? For example, when you quit? see someone, you said like, oh, he's going to quit. Uh, I don't know if there's a stereotype. I, I think what we find is the, the people that sometimes you'll find people that you think there's no way that they should quit. Like I said, it could be an Olympic athlete or, um, you know, a, a world-class wrestler or triathlete. And for some reason, that person just gets on their brain that, that they're not going to make it. And, and they get that doubt in their head. So I typically tell candidates that are starting training, uh, you know, three basic things. You know, one, you know, never think about quitting. Like always think about you're going to be successful. Once you kind of get that quit on your brain, it gets into your head mentally. And, and I find that you're, you know, those individuals just are, are not successful. So never think about quitting. Like always think about yourself being successful. You know, try to break, second thing, try to break things down into small manageable pieces so for us going through this really hard training it can be all right i'm just going to make it to the next meal i'm just gonna you know make it to the next training evolution so you're not thinking about how hard this whole week's going to be you're just trying to make it through to the next you know thing that you think you can make it through to and then um the final thing would be like you know it's worth it in the end so you know, no matter how hard this training is, like it'll be worth it when you get to, you know, be an actual SEAL and get to a SEAL team and join your first platoon. Like, don't don't think about how hard it is right now and how miserable you are. Like, think about how awesome it'll be when you get through training. So yeah, stereotypes are hard because we never know who's actually going to make it through. So it can be surprising sometimes when when someone quits. Well, amazing talk, um, really incredible lessons learned. And uh, I think, you know, we, we, in neurosurgery, we get just, you know, we're, we're so focused on, on the neurosurgery part of things, at least for me, and I think for everybody else, it's, it's really valuable for us to think about these concepts, big concepts that are very important that um, transcend specialties. Um, and so I, I, I really, you know, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your insights and expertise uh, with us today. It's, it's very valuable and, and much appreciated. Well, thanks for having me. I'm super impressed that you do this every Monday, that you share as much as you do across your organization and that you would uh, invite me to, to speak. It's, it's really impressive. I hope we can emulate some similar things in, in our organization um, as we go forward and, and we try to do similar things like this, but, uh, like I said, it's, I'm honored to, to come in and speak. Uh, I'm glad, you know, you, you find it valuable and, uh, I, I appreciate the invite. All right. Thanks. I think there is, uh, th there's one more link. There's maybe a couple of faculty who are, um, um, on online there. I think you have, do you have that? Uh, is there a question or? I, I think I think there's a separate link. Um, okay, yeah, I think I have for, that. Okay, great, awesome. All right, well, thanks everybody. Have a have a great day.